We want to welcome you to the Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School class today. Um, David will not be with us. His sister passed, and he's up in Canada uh, for memorial service this weekend. So we might want to remember David uh, this weekend. His sister had been ill for quite a while, uh, but still, like we know from our own experience, even though they're ill when they passed, it's still kind of the finality of it. So remember David in your prayers and thoughts next several days and weeks. And after that, for a couple weeks, we're going to be studying the Apocrypha and how it related, or how it, it entered in and was used by early Seventh-day Adventists. So uh, uh, that's going to be very interesting. Uh, it, it's going to be the last two um, Sabbaths of the month. So anyway, um, I can't think I want to introduce our speaker today. We're going to have... Dr. Graham Stacy. Dr. Stacy uh, is going to be going back to Australia seriously. Uh, I guess because that's where your children and grandchildren, or most of your most, children most and grandchildren, and I do understand that. Uh, we got to see our grandchildren last week. Uh, anyway, uh, Graham has been a pastor, a youth pastor for many years. Uh, Graham, I've appreciated your comments in our class, in, in your lectures, and our our thoughts and prayers will be with you and your family as you go back to Australia. So uh, let's just bow our heads. Uh, gracious Father, we ask that you be with us today, that uh, you be with Graham especially, uh, not just here, but in his plans and return to Australia. Watch over him, and we pray in your name. Amen. Good, good morning. We're on? Yeah, good morning. Um, yeah, uh, Roseanne and I are a, a little a little preoccupied with a few things that are, are going on. We're uh, not wanting to make excuses. I did have a topic uh, planned, but uh, right now um, we're selling a house, uh, selling car, and those are. I mean, you've all done it. I know, uh, selling cars and. Uh, moving to a condo and packing ready for a container and finalizing things at work and retiring at the same time which uh, is uh, very interesting um, to do it all at once uh, you know leaving friends and uh, grandchildren and sons-in-laws and daughters it's all a bit of a challenge um, and things like this sabbath school um, I'll, I'll try and hook in as often as I can, but uh, at least this time of the year, it's about, what is it, six, five, six, seven? It, it varies with daylight saving and so on, but it's the middle of the night, I'm going to assure you. So um, they were suggesting at work the other day, oh, you could video conference in and you'd be fine. I said, yeah, right. Um, one o'clock in the morning, not quite. And... Uh, and I sort of did remind them too that probably by, by the, the way, it's three thirty tomorrow morning in Sydney right now. Uh, is that right? Okay. So I could check on the football scores after all. Right? Okay. Um, but uh, you know, leaving leaving a community and environment like this is, um, I, I think we take it for granted. We're we're not always sure uh, how much of a blessing these sort of uh, experiences are until you don't have them. And, uh, we'll be looking around to see what we can find uh, over there. Thank you for the friendship. Uh, we've been backwards and forwards here to Loma Linda. My goodness, uh, our first uh, sojourn was, uh, we were just reminding Rod, it was back in the mid 80s. Came our first little uh, sortie and did one degree and went back and paid off our time and came back in the 90s and uh, like many people, came for five years and stayed for 25. It sort of happens that way a little bit. Um, but we've been blessed. Um, we've enjoyed it. And uh, it's, it's been just good for, for us all. And, and lots of you, we've got lots of connections for different ways. And uh, uh, we appreciate it very much. Um, my wife over here, Roseanne, um, 
Actually, she's better known in this community than I am. I'm, I'm sort of a low, you know, low energy, low functioning sort of person. But wherever we go, uh, Roseanne gets greeted with, "Oh, Mrs. Stacy." You know, they can't bring herself bring themselves to call her Roseanne, but it's always <laughs> Mrs. Stacy because she taught their kids. You know, and uh, I, I think I did mention some the other week, which is sort of probably not appropriate, but. When I was having a little attention in the urology department, which you know, it's it's sort of a it's sort of a personal moment in urology, um, and I walk in there, and so the nurse practitioner greets me. Oh, hello, Desmond. I'm always Desmond, see, because that's my legal name, Desmond Graham. Well, oh, hello, Desmond. So I know that's always the first indication these people don't have a clue who we are. That's fine, uh, but then it's oh, Mrs. Stacy. And I'm going to tell you, while this nurse practitioner is attending to things connected with urology, <laughs> she's chatting to my wife about, oh, remember when we told I mean, the kids are doing it. You know, probably a diversion. I understand you, urology crowd. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'm thinking to myself, a little attention here, please. You know? Let's get a focus. Anyway, Roseanne's very well known. And uh, she put in many, many years of teaching uh, her whole career was put in teaching uh, church school and very proud of it and uh, she did very well at it. I'm, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit now. So she's well known and she did a good job. Um, yes, yes. Very good job. Um, one of the discussions we used to have when we would be walking would be she, she was always very conscientious and remained so about how to teach Bible to the kids. And we would often talk about, and she would express, and I hope I'm not breaking too many rules here, she's retired, so what can you do to her now? Um, but she would often talk about, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna teach that story. That, that's gross. I don't know whether you used that word, but we sort of got around to that sort of stuff. And for those of you in the room whose children were taught by her, we, we apologise if their you know, lives have been ruined by that. But um, uh, she would often say, you know, I, I teach eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and sometimes seven, you know. Um, they are not at the stage or equipped to hear a story about, and he cut off his head, wasn't that great? Let's all sort of be happy about this. <laughs> or all of these people, men, women and children, were all put to death, let's cheer about it. Children were not, and you know that, and we've, we've all made those adjustments in our heads. I'm not telling you anything you haven't already done. How to sort of celebrate um, where, where to tell the stories or what stories to tell. I know you will have done it. You've raised your families. You're probably in the grandchildren stage or great-grandchildren, oh, who knows. But uh, you've, d you've done all of those uh, sorts of things. Uh, but Roseanne was always very uh, concerned about that. It, now, it was very easy, <coughs> I guess, to um, get to the to deal with the easy ones, and, and, and the more difficult ones never came up, but the easy ones like, you know, David and Goliath, and, you know, Cain and Abel, Cain killing his brother, and, you know, the envy stories, or the Abraham and Isaac even, and, you know, you can dress it up and say, this is, isn't this a good story, whatever, but, um, the age appropriateness of the of the story for the children it's, it's just not a slam dunk every even though we we are very conscious of the fact that we take the bible seriously uh, there are some we have to work on a little more to make sure that they fitted there uh, then of course and i know none of you would have been confronted with this and none of you would have even thought about it but to go and dig down into Deuteronomy and some of those places where even the X-rated story, where they're sort of kept, you know, 
uh, about this woman who intervenes when two men were fighting and she happened to grab one man by his general so the, the law was cut off her hand. You know, I mean, none, none of us would even think about the appropriateness of sharing those sort of stories, let, let alone, uh, you know, the envy stories, the ethnic cleansy stories, the, the uh, adultery, the incest, the gender, you know, they're easy to deal with, right? Uh, there isn't a lot of temptation to sort of bring those out and say, let's see what we can make about that, let alone in adult Sabbath school, you know, let alone children's Sabbath school, because we wouldn't do it here either. Um, and, and it sort of led us to think about, so, um, and, I, and I want to uh, uh, have some discussion with you. Um, simplistic as some of these questions may be, um, are all the stories suitable for children? And I think they have, you know, the way we would share them, the obvious answer is no. You know, um, and we, there's a whole industry out there, as we know, where people go and pick out the ones that sort of are appropriate and we make a big deal of all that, which is fine, which is good. Um, could some be damaging for children if we've got the age appropriateness wrong? Um, I actually think yes, um, without much, you know, you need to give some reflection to some of this. So the follow-up question would be, why are they included? Um, you know, Bible, inspired, whatever. I I'm sure there's, could, but why are they there? What spiritual message do you get from the story about the woman having her hand cut off because she grabbed the genitals of two sparring people. Why is that there? Is it absolutely necessary to have the story in there about uh, herding people into a tower to um, kill them? Burn them? Are they are they necessary? It's it's worth the sort of reflection. You know, we wouldn't teach them to the children. Right? Well, of course not. But do you need to know about that? Has that made your life better, knowing about that? So, um, I don't know what you would do, but I'm sure all of you have already sort of done this. Um, which ones would you not share? Let's just think of children for a moment. And you've all done it with your own children. Which ones would we not share? And for what reasons? Anybody, I mean, I don't know whether you want to use the mic or not, but do you have any ones in mind that you you wouldn't bother to share with the kids? And why wouldn't you share it? See, it, it is there, isn't it? It is in the scripture. So, there. To, to follow up on, on Callum's comment that you did a moment ago, in some sense, Adventist Church has a model already with Uncle Arthur. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. If you go, I... I remember reading through Uncle Arthur's stories when I was a kid, and I don't recall being horrified no, of the story. Not. So he must have been quite selective in his uh, telling of the of the story. Of and the appropriately story. so, right? And and and, and uh, some good things were done. I think, uh, and and this is not an occasion to sort of um, uh, denigrate that because they were good. They were good things. Probably we went a little far with the moralising, but you know, let's. We're, None of us probably got together a good set of books like that. Some of us got through college by selling them to the neighbourhood, so it wasn't all that. Um, all right, Calvin or, or uh, Rob? Yeah. In my reflection, um, since childhood, it's very important with Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories or any of these stories to understand what your children are absorbing. It's not in the, It's like a rite of passage. We give them the Bible stories. And, and some of my relatives have done that. Um, and they've told me some disturbing stories, but from my own experience, reading Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories and linking it to other religious materials that were in the house sure. as a 10 and 11 year old, I was a fully terrorized Seventh-day Adventist by the time I was 13 or 14. Um, these were like the nursery rhymes, Jack and the Bean score, Red Riding Hood. It's like everything bad happened. 
And I didn't want to go into the lion's den or be tested out that way. I didn't want to be swallowed by a whale, etc., etc. It went on and on. My sisters still have nightmares today about Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories, and they're in their 60s, and they will never come back to a Seventh-day Adventist church. And mm. um, my yeah. father asked me once when I was about 12, um, do you pray? It's the first religious question he ever asked me. And I said, yes. He said, what do you pray about? I asked him because I heard him pray at a, at a gathering. And, and I said, I pray that my parents, that I will never be separated from you and mum. Um, um, so when I pray, I ask that God will take my hand or my leg, and if he's going to take a hand, he take my left hand and not my right hand, because my right hand is more useful. I was bargaining with God that I would never be separated from my parents. That's what I was absorbing. My father picked up those uh, bedtime stories at Daniel and Revelation that had the pictures of the beasts and the other uh, scary things, took them out and burnt them on a log fire. Mm. I'm sure we could find anecdotes, you know, and repeats of those stories. And I think we could probably, to be fair, we, we could find a number of people said, I got through childhood and sort of got that into a different place and it, and it didn't traumatise, but um, etc. And it's the, probably the way we handle it. Maybe just one or two more and then I'll keep going. Here. Cal. Okay. Yeah, I just have been mentioning to Leo that I thought I remembered the Harry Anderson illustration of the very story you were telling, but maybe that's a part. No, anyway, I don't think he illustrated that. Um, but a couple of things I just was realizing that as you said that, it's interesting in Seventh-day Adventists how much of our interpretation of the Bible really has been filtered through sources other than directly the Bible itself. You know, whether it's the Conflict of the Ages series, the Bible storybooks, and um, like you mentioned, a lot of the, the morals that are drawn there may not necessarily even be drawn at all in the original text. And I discovered sure. that when I was a student at Fuller in a preaching class. And I made just some offhanded reference to something, and then afterwards the teacher was saying, well, you know, that or he said, you know, that isn't in the text. And, you know, I thought I'd done a good job of exegesis, but, you know, he, I realized that how much of my Bible story knowledge has been filtered through, through very distinct sources and to the point that I'm sure some things are there that aren't, that are actually come from, from other sources. So it's just kind of an interesting part of our, but sure. even with Uncle Arthur, there's a lot of things that got filtered out. Sure. But there's some things that are very casually put in that are bloody, you know, violent and yeah. so, so yeah. forth. So it's a kind of an interesting selective process. There. Yeah, yes. and, and probably appropriate. And, and I'm not, I, please, I, I'm not here in any way sort of saying we shouldn't even consider, but I think we've all, uh, and I will go, to, to, I need to go to Miss Johnson, then I'll give you the first shot on the next round. But, um, um, you know, uh, we've all done it. And, you know, one of my points is, is that, and even with the adult stories, if it's all that important, why is it there? Really? If, if and, and to push the envelope a little bit, if it's all inspired, what are you getting out of it? Um, I, 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 okay, so where else? I was going to go. Uh, someone who's had a lot to do with putting together curriculum, so go ahead. <coughs> yes. In our house, Uncle Arthur's stories were banned, but my kids went to other Adventist homes and absorbed every one of them yeah. they could lay their hands on. Yeah. I think what's important is your attitude to God and to your children. Right. When a loving parent tells a story, um, they find a way to make it work. Yeah. And. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is never tell a story from the point of view of the enemy of God. For instance, the story of Jericho, of the walls falling. Um, a lot of people are horrified by that story. Um, but many of them start telling the story from the point of view of the people up on the wall and what they were seeing. When you see it from their point of view, it's quite different. 
when you see it from the Israelites point of view it was us or them yeah. and the Lord is telling kids that he's on our side yeah. and um, I, I've seen um, the David and Goliath story told where the, the stone leaves David's sling and it goes you know, I mean, you have to see my hand yeah. to see that. You know, so it's not like a bam, but it's you know. Okay. Well, and <laughs> um, let's let, we'll continue the conversation as we go. I, I think I could make the point, and I agree with it on one hand that if your attitude and the way you were telling the stories will help tidy it up and make a good thing out of it. Uh, we've got to admit on the same side that people who don't see it that way or who were traumatised or who are, uh, I mean, you can see it the other way. And, and that's just the children's story. I want to move on, but even some of the adult stories, you know, um, where there's not a lot of commentary about, uh, you know, the rape of Tamar, the, the, the incest stories that go on there. I would put it to you as adults because there's not children's at school. Why are they there? What purpose would that possibly solve? Now, while, while I've teased you with that, let's, let's move on a little bit, and I'll give others um, a little chance because your comments are more important than, than mine here. Um, I want to introduce a new a, a word that I know is going to push the wrong buttons, but I've got to sort of put it out there. Um, let me put the word out, fantasy. Now, I know for most of us, as we would think about fantasy, we would think about that which is opposition to real. So let's, let's see if we can broaden it a little bit in your thinking. Um, uh, not only because Victoria Flanagan happens to work in the Macquarie University in Sydney, did I read this? It just <laughs> happened to be. Um, fantasy is an indirection, a metaphor, an allegory, a parable and can therefore deal with complex moral questions in a more playful or more exaggerated manner. Just hold that thought for a minute and, and let me put out uh, a, a bit of a premise that, well, let me start off this way. One of the things I like reading and I get into, and you can imagine with my pathology, is that I've got a psychology part of me and I've got a faith-based part of me, a pastor part of me, and I just love trying to see how those worlds fit together and, and how they speak to each other and what I can learn about that. Um, I love going in and looking at things like um, oh, conversion motifs, for instance. Like, conversion is not separate from the reality of the psychology, whatever. I remember having, bringing this up at a meeting once where somebody were, uh, took to me uh, verbally uh, about the idea of uh, how bad um, hypnosis was. And I said, you know, um, let's just think about it as an altered state of consciousness. All right? Hypnosis. And I said, and they said, well, you know, what about this and controlling people's minds? I said, let me tell you a different story. Folks, just listen to my voice. As the Spirit speaks to you, come forward, just one at a time. All heads bowed, just, or you can just raise your hand. Uh, I, I can make the case for you that um, an altar call done in the old-fashioned way can be just as altered state of consciousness as anything else. So I love getting into sort of looking at those sort of things. Uh, why children... Uh, you know, what's the experience of children and religion and well, how do we express, I mean, all of that sort of stuff. And I won't go through the whole textbook of the psychology of religion, but um, one of the things I want to just put on the table for today is that in children, at a certain stage, a little less than the whole lot and then a little less as it sort of goes through its curve, sort of the three to seven year olds, fantasy is a big way of, the, is the way they see the world. Now you know that because you, when you had kids or grandkids, they got into all sorts of stuff. 
I don't know what your beliefs are, but you probably didn't beat them up when, you know, well, Santa Claus is coming and you sort of knew that eventually they'd know that it was you drinking the milk and having the cookie. But, you know, um, there was this sort of reality, uh, not reality, but this fantasy world that they live in. And there's a whole genre of literature out there which I, in which I'm not an expert, but I read a little bit about it because of my interest in psychology and religion, where it's very normal, it's very natural, it's very appropriate and necessary that we recognise children going through this phase of fantasy as they consider the world out there. Let me read a couple of things to you. Um, uh, uh, about this particular topic. Oh, by the way, um, I have I have a little five and a half year old going on seventeen. By the way, her name's Caitlin Savage, who's my granddaughter. She visits us often, and uh, you know when they say a five year old has a vocab of about two and a half thousand words, they didn't they didn't she wasn't part of the sample. Uh, because whatever her vocab is, it's way beyond two and a half thousand. And, uh, but she loves when she comes to visit Roseanne. Dress ups is the number one activity for the day, and she's got all of these costumes and stuff. And there's we're not going, oh, you know, when she's dancing around the room, no, moving to music around the room with different little <laughs> costumes on, because that's where she is developmentally. She's living in a world that, that is quite okay to be fanciful about uh, the reality. Let me read a couple of things that... If you were to consider... Uh, maybe I'll go to the next slide here. Just see. Yeah. Um, if you were to look at kids and their social development, their emotional development, um, there, there's a lot to do with what fantasy goes on. A great deal of social development occurs in fantasy play, for instance. All right? where they become, you know, there's a lot of social engagement and learning the rules of, uh, of social engagement and dealing with others in fantasy play. It, um, in fact, some, some uh, people would suggest if the children don't do the fantasy stuff, they're more likely to be, uh, you know, um, stilted and, and, and not adjusted as well uh, later on. It's a very necessary part, a very normal part, if you like. God built them that way. That's the way they go through um, in dealing with this. Um, fantasy is not escapism, says those who deal with this. Um, it's a roundabout way of engaging with genuine, genuine problems. Fantasy is vital for the human mind. It is the psychological process by which a child learns to fill in the gaps between knowledge, reality and experience. Vital coping mechanism. Fantasy offers children and rehearsed, a rehearsed exploration of the too big, too wide, too dangerous world getting closer and closer to them every day. See how they say? Right. These people would make the argument that fantasy literature, for instance, you know, we Western sort of Christian, we, we sort of like the reality stuff. And we probably came through school zone fantasy. But, but the literature people would say, this is necessary, this is good, this fantasy play, this fantasy reading. Uh, and those of you who have let your kids get into the sort of newer genres of the fantasy thing there, know that they, they, get, they get right into it. It's like an emotional dress rehearsal, a contextual framework within which to limber up for real life when it hits. Okay. Um, Fantasy allows readers to experiment with different ways of seeing the world. It takes a hypothetical situation and invites its readers or listeners to make connections between this fictive scenario and their own reality. It allows them to play with hypothetical situations. Um, and as I had up here before, it's an indirection. It's pulling in a metaphor, a different way to try out the world and to understand it and to get a sort of a more uh, balanced emotional response to sort of the real world as it's coming. I'm not going to advocate this next guy's position, but it was very interesting. I came across an article as I was thinking about this from um, a guy by the name of Brandon Withrow, and I can give you the quote. 
And, but the title of his article was Why Your Bible Feels Like Fantasy Literature. And he went on to sort of give some examples. This is not my point of view necessarily, but it's an interesting spot. Um, he, he talks about the Bible. It's the uh, universe defies our physics. And he goes on to give, you know, Jacob's Ladder, and uh, you know, they gave stories about how um, it really wasn't that much different from fantasy literature. And again, I know fantasy pushes the wrong buttons, right? Because we want to deal with reality, not fantasy. But just think of fantasy in that bigger world, that bigger world. Um, he goes on to say, Earth is a strange planet topped by a dome that holds back the waters of heaven uh, later on. Um, it, it gives illustrations of supernatural transportation, you know, the chariots of fire, the, uh, the ziggurats climbing into heaven, the, uh, bizarre beings wandering around, talking snakes, talking donkeys, giants, off, that were considered by some as the offspring of angels and humans. Monstrous sea serpents, mythical heroes, um, um, and he had a couple of others here. I just, I just need to just give them to you. Um, well, that that will probably do. But he he made the point out um, that there were very uh, much similar. This was his point. Um, oh, people with otherworldly uh, powers, sorcerers, magicians. Uh, turning staffs into uh, snakes or snakes into staffs and uh, the world full of demons and red. The point he made was, do you know what? There are some aspects that, that seem like the genre called fantasy literature. Now, um, well, um, I'm not sure whether I'm ready to take this spot and then we'll come up here, but um, I wonder if it would be healthy to let our children read some of the stories just like we let them read some of the genre called fantasy literature. Well, grim fairy tales. Well, I'm not, you know, grim's not particularly nice because they're sort of brutal <laughs> and chopping people up and stuff. but. That's the stage where they are. And they're making sense of their world by using that sort of extended metaphor and parable and allegory. Like, and again, you, you probably won't be comfortable with me for this, but, um, and I'll get around to this a little bit more, but the story of Jonah and the whale is a true story. But whether it needs to be factual or not depends on how you want to read it. Right? I don't think any of the truth is lost in saying, well, it was a fish, not a whale, or it was a whale, not a fish, or whatever. That we sort of get involved with that sort of stuff. The truth of the story was, I tried to run away from God and God brought me back. And the children, I think, could read that story and, and get the truth out of it. But and I think I've mentioned this here before, and I, you know, I can be challenged on on, on this. But um, we Westerners have been the ones who've wanted to equate truth with fact, or fact with truth. Others have been able to hear these true stories, telling truths about God and life and experience and whatever. Uh, but we're not troubled by the fact that. It, the oral tradition people would say it's only when you started writing this stuff down that people could check with you on the last version of the story you told. Previously it didn't matter if you just told the story of truth about God protecting and whatever. But then later on, once things got written down, you could be checked on. Alright, so let me go here first. I, I knew the words would sort of do something, but you know, let's have a go. For, for an odd reason I won't mention, uh, Levon Neff encouraged me at this late day to read uh, at least the first of the Harry Potter books. Huh. And if you know the story of these books, they never would have reached uh, the light of day had it not been that the eight-year-old daughter of one of the publishing house people said, yes, get this book. Uh, 
at her stage. And when I see this, this um, list of fantasy elements in the Bible, I say, of course. That sort of thing happens all the time in Harry Potter. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But and, and can I throw in another one? Let's just throw in the Narnia series that's a little easier to consume. None of us, I think, go, when, you know, the, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe are doing their thing, we know that there's a story there and there's a truth to be gathered. And we can assimilate that truth. Lord Keep going. And, and for the, uh, the hypothetical uh, helping us uh, cope with scary hypothetical things, there's a series of uh, movies or videos now, I think produced by an Australian woman, where she, where she um, dramatizes in horrifying detail the events of the last day, you know, and the evil people coming after us in the rocks and the mountains. Yeah. Now, finally, I need to go back to the previous point just to make one interesting observation. I suddenly realize why that story about a person of one gender grabbing the genitals of a person of another gender, why, that's in the Bible. Only in our day can we understand that that's an appropriate punishment. I wasn't going to go there, but thank you for that. Have you ever heard of Bobby? Yeah. Um, you, you're taking me in, in directions I wasn't going to go. A comment from Ladan, and then I'll, 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 I'll... Up here, thank you. No, no, please, please. Well, I remember back to studying art history in college and being taught about medieval manuscripts and in the center would be maybe the biblical manuscript and then there was the limbic part, the border all the way around the outside where you'd see gargoyles and all these dark things happening. And I think not only for children but for adults, we always, we're always we having to deal with that, whatever stage of society we're in, whatever stage of life we're in. And the Bible's dealing with those things, too. Indeed. Indeed. That, that would be the point that those... In, and again, I'm just putting this out for the discussion today, but that's what the people in, in that genre of literature and the imaginary play people would say. This is the way that these are positive and can be used. And I'm go, I've got one more point to sort of make before uh, I wrap up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I grew up in, the, um, in Iran, so... Um, we had Christians, Muslims, Jews, Zoroastrians, Baha'is, all kinds of <coughs> things in my immediate family. So Bible stories were not unique and we had to navigate. Right. But among all those, um, I think right now I, I have two children that are married to non-Christian. And so their children are growing up with no stories or whatever. But among all these people that I've had to navigate in my life, love has never been different. Integrity, um, affection, uh, sacrifice, they have never been different. They've, they've been there. I mean, I don't know the stories, but um, whatever we think fits into Bible stories, it fits into the story of love. I don't have to defend me loving and sacrificing for somebody and telling that story from any kind of a faith or no faith yeah. or torture. I know torture. Yeah. We've been through it. Yeah. Um, but love, I mean, and justifying our behavior because we have the doctrine and we can do torture and non-love things. I think we've done that through our literature a lot. That doesn't go very well right now with our children. Right, right. Um, there are others, and I, and I, I want to give you a chance to just maybe one or two other points, is that uh, one of the phrases I like using is that I, I think these things, in its total, the stories, the biblical pad, are a means to an end and not an end in itself. That's my language. Um, meaning there's a purpose to why we do this. Let's focus on the purpose rather than getting stuck in the vehicle. All right? Getting stuck in the vehicle is, no, it was a fish, not a whale. You know, the gills wouldn't work. I mean, you know, that's getting stuck in, in the vehicle. Um, 
the, 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 the meaning, the truth in that story is someone who tried to escape in their thinking of responsibility to God, and you know, there's a truth there. And, and uh, I think teachers like my wife did a good thing in being able to say, you know, I don't think the kids need to have that one. Uh, just to be good people, what if they can, you know? But we seem stuck on the vehicle somewhat, um, and and can't get past it. Maybe just one or two other things, and then I'll <coughs> I'll stop completely. Um, do you know? I, and I've said some of these things. Um, let me sort of set it up this way. Um, and and I've got a little thing here about um, uh, the difference between truth and fact, etc. And we need a little more research here because this is my statement. Um, if you've done, and I'll try and cut this short, but if you've done any reading lately about the disaffiliation of people from faith, it's, it's on a tear right now. You know, whereas 25 years ago it was 10% of this age group were disaffiliated, now it's 45%. Uh, irrespective of the influence of the religious right and all of that sort of stuff at the moment, it's on a tear. People are pulling away. One of the things I would like to investigate more and think about more, because I know I've sort of put out a hypothesis here, is that um, while fantasy is a, you know, is a potential, is an important part of children, and they could read the stories in that way, when we push and force that children, when they get out of that stage, still must believe that these are fact, I believe that we're pushing people to disaffiliate. I think we're pushing, you know, call it cognitive dissonance, call it whatever you like, but, but I know that cognitive dissonance works here. You get to a stage and young adults are leaving religion on a tear, and that's in the United States. And we haven't seen the impact of, the, you know, this is my only political statement of the day, we haven't seen the impact of the current political situation and it's lying in bed with religious conservatism. We haven't seen the impact of that yet. I think the next 10 years you're going to see people abandon Christianity in droves. Leave that comment for today because that will get me strung up anyway. But um, I think there's, a, there's enough here... And my point is, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of losing track of it because I'm trying to shorten it up here. Um, when you insist on fact, contrary to the evidence, it fosters the rejection of evidence in other issues. And there's a whole plethora of uh, research out there showing the more conservative the people, the more rigid, the more literalistic, the more fundamentalist, whatever word you want to put in there, the more likely they are to uh, reject things like climate change, social justice, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, you know, I used to have people say to me, it doesn't matter. And I would say it does matter. As a psychologist, I'm going to tell you, it, it has its consequences. You continue to push this line where, where, um, where, parts of the script, like the Bible being anti-science, you continue to push that, you're going to have people, uh, that's why religious people are disconnected from the real world out there. You know, issues of social justice, issues of LGBTQ. When we know there's a science out there saying, this is now different from what you understood. And we're contributing to it. And I think the way we have gone about using these stories... And I believe that they're inspired, by the way. I believe it's, they're worthy of reading. They're worthy of learning. And God can use them. I'm not, I'm not saying throw this out in any way. Um, that, that, that's my point there. So what if we were to sort of take it that way? Can I just finish this last little bit? Uh, these are my recommendations. Uh, and then you uh, have the floor again. Um, I would tell the stories from the Bible. That is, the stories tell us of others making sense of their realities and trying to better understand the divine human connections. I would tell the stories. Age, you know, insist that the stories are age appropriate for my audience. Right? Allow for the hearers, uh, allow for their developmental process. 
um, it's not going to worry me too much if, if the kids are going to say, you know, that's a really good story. You know, it tells us about God without getting into whether it was a fish or a whale. It's not the point. <coughs> Allow for the truth fact for, for, uh, distinction. I'm not an expert in oral tradition, but I've read a fair bit, and uh, they make the point very clearly that in an oral tradition, the importance was about the truth being communicated, not the fact of the story. All right? And I, in my own little part of my world, I'm prepared to say, if I would let go of some of that, I can get more of this. And I can get my children, my young people and so on, to, to know as, as the evidence comes into them and they say, you know what, those gotcha texts about LGBTQ, do I have to believe that? And I'd say, no, no, no. That's what they thought. That was the best understanding they had of the day. But God has revealed to us new stuff about biology and biopsychosocial -psycho models and so on. We now know it's different. So rather than forcing them into, you're either a Christian and you're anti, you know, gay, uh, or, you know, or you're losing your faith because you're pro, whatever, we say, you know, that was the understanding. But it is okay to refine that and to move on. God does that. Um, eliminate the telling of stories that are potentially damaging. We have to do some talking about what that's about. Um, you know, and, and I'll just throw this in. The, 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 I think you guys that argue for the role of women in the church by going back to the Bible story, I understand why you do it because that's, that's the platform on which we operate. Um, but I think that's... A, almost a useless task because we know how they pictured it in those days I mean you can do your theological magic and sort of say well it really does mean this or whatever um, but I think it's just as easy to say that's how they saw it it's 2,000 years ago it doesn't apply let's move on um, and when I sometimes I talk here I say to David I've got a very simple faith and he usually says that's pretty disingenuous, you know. I said, no, I don't have to deal with all of this stuff about capricious gods and, you know, all this sort of stuff. I just have to say, it's okay. The information is now different. Um, God's added to that information. We now see it differently. It's okay to move on. Eliminate, yeah, I did that one. Uh, and I had to have 10. You know, I, I, I stopped at 9 earlier, about 3 o'clock this morning. I was very disturbed. I had to go and make another one. <laughs> Focus on finding and emphasizing the true principles. Allow for and embrace the contextual applications. This is what this story may have said to its hearers in times past. I think that's a legitimate way of reading those stories. As a general rule, minimize the moralizing but increase the discussion at the conclusion of the stories. Allow the stories to do their work without too much outside help. Narnia series. Read the stories, it doesn't work. However, when necessary, confront the ambiguities. I wondered about that word, but using gotcha text to form moral arguments, you know, is quite frankly dishonest. It's just dishonest. Um, and, and we should be better than that. Uh, do more talking with rather than talking at others when we're sort of seeking what, what, what truths are coming out of these sort of things. Yep, not going there. Done. Here. Well, you know, there's a body of literature <clears throat> in uh, historiography, <clears throat> and perhaps the the, the most interesting uh, writer today would be Hayden White, and he, he points out that the writing of fiction and the writing of history. Um, is similar, and that there is a very fine line between history and fiction, and um, uh, you know, probably, probably some of it is, is sort of a, a reconceptualization anyway. And there's the different historiographical approaches. You have Leopold von Ranke, just tell it like it is, what happened. And, and <clears throat> most historians realize that that's <coughs> not 
practical or even possible to do. Um, we all have presentist um, prejudices that we uh, bring to the to the, to the process. Um, but I did want to go on the other direction and sure. and, and, and and point out that. Um, Although I'm not an, an expert in, in folklore, I'm told by our English teachers that the stories of the Bible are very different than uh, fairy tales. Um, I think it was Vladimir Prop, the Russian formalist, who demonstrated that all the, the Russian uh, folklore tales could be structurally analyzed, that there was a villain, there was a you know, all the different elements, and just like making Campbell's soup you, and writing a story, you put all these elements together. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, Roland Barth, in his uh, essay on the, on the uh, encounter of, uh, of Jacob and the angel, um, uh, points out that, that, that and, and he was a structuralist, of course, and he points out the, 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 the difference in, in that uh, in that, that that Jacob is sent by God and yet he is stopped by God, and he says that that sort of uh, structural element we just don't find in any of the other stories. And so I think there's something unique about the Bible stories that differentiate themselves from ordinary folklore. Sure. Um. You know, uh, may maybe on another day we could sort of deconstruct some of those X-rated ones and see how important they are um, uh, to be included. But, but you know, I, I, again, I'm not wanting to sort of throw anything away. I'm just actually my, my great my great hope is, and and I'll just share this bit. I worked as a youth pastor for a long time, and I realised <coughs> early on in being a youth pastor when I'd hear the stories of kids coming in and going out of the church and so on, that we as a church were probably not much better than other churches, and that within you know, 10, 15 years, 20% uh, of those kids would still be having anything to do with faith. You know, and, and you can throw numbers out there, but, but it's, it's pretty consistent across the churches. Uh, right now in America, it's uh, the greatest loss that's coming from Catholic churches of all interest for whatever reason. But I realized that um, uh, there were lots of, and there are many, many, many reasons why people will disaffiliate from faith and church and God. And I'm not, doing, I'm not bringing it down to one thing, please. There's many, many reasons. Bad experiences, uh, you know, whatever. Um, but the major reason cited by young people disaffiliating is um, they just can't believe that stuff anymore. So taking that on board, I'm thinking, well, are we contributing to that by the way we present what we've got? And while I'd like to do a lot more research, I suspect uncomfortably we are. Uh, we'll go here and then we'll finish with Gary. Error is never harmless. What I can see is that the wise of the world, or the deep thinkers, can cunningly uh, mix truth and error. It, just for the purpose of discrediting God's word. And we should be very, very careful. Sure. Because sure. I, I can see that in your presentation, <coughs> I see that sure. the, the uh, idea of um, hypnotizing, you know, uh, and many other ideas that you present that are very difficult to deal with. Sure, sure. Well, I'm sorry about that. Um, but, but I would challenge you with the fact, and, and Gary and Dr. Fraser's over here, um, I wonder how many of you would be happy um, with uh, postulating or defending um, a 12th century version of hell right now. 
you know, that there's people burning there and they're burning for eternity. And, uh, is there anybody in the room who wants to go with that metaphor or that idea? I'm going to suggest to you that while what you, I've said may be a little uncomfortable in some way, we've been doing it a long time. And I don't find, in the people I meet with, I don't find anybody making a strong defence of what was a cardinal Christian doctrine uh, several hundred years ago. Because we've taken it on board and we've thought about it and we've thought, you know, or whatever reason, whatever we've done with it, uh, we've allowed ourselves permission to refine that. Just saying. So, you know, this truth and error is... is uh, it's a bit of a moving target at times, but Gary, last, last comment. Uh, yeah, thank you, Graham. Um, I find myself uh, actually in agreement with nearly everything you've said, so appreciated it. Um, you know, I think that reading fantasy as a kid uh, was something which has been very helpful to me. Uh, I hear quite a few Australian accents here. I'm, I'm a Kiwi. Uh, Slightly disturbed we're, cousins, we're you know. Right that they <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you may remember uh, Enid Blight. Yes. When I was a kid, between the age of about five and ten, I loved Noddy and the Secret Seven and the Famous Five and things like that. And um, you know, my parents let me do it. I mean, we grew up Adventist. But I think it's been helpful to me. Um, I think it's maybe helped me be a bit more innovative in my professional life. I think it's helped me understand and interpret some of these biblical stories even. I mean, I think if I hadn't uh, had that kind of background and was more kind of grounded in facts, yeah. it would have um, been unhelpful me. In fact, it's yeah. often more fantastical than, than we realize. Yes, and uh, I think religion is as well, indeed. perhaps. Indeed. And I sometimes wonder if our marvelous universe is so flexible that almost anything we can fantasize can become a reality. <laughs> another discussion on another day. Um, thank you for being so polite to have a conversation. These are all, this is a Sabbath school where at least putting out an idea and you can have some discussion is, is a helpful thing to do. Um, why don't you lead us in that benediction? First, um, since I have the mic, I, I would like to share, I like the idea of error, and I'd like to share an error that occurred when I was five or six, and I was reading The Little Friend, <coughs> and it was about a family who was broke. And if I can remember at all, finally got paid, but it was sundown. They had no money for no food. They had just gotten the money, but the sun had set. So they refused to eat for the entire Sabbath, including they did not feed their children. And I recall, as a child, thinking, you are stupid. <laughs> and your God is not my God. My God would want me to eat. My God would want my children to eat. I was a very odd six-year-old, apparently. So to me, we have to be careful, because there are times the way we interpret what we've read in the Bible, we're missing the truth of the good God, and sticking to the sun goes down, all of a sudden you can't do anything. Um, they could have at least called the local Adventist pastor and said, I'm hungry and I have no food. So again, I was thinking, very stupid. And to me, that was is an example of error that, that crept in. OK, um, benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Happy Sabbath.